So we've got a, quite a large audience today, which is absolutely wonderful to see. And we're thrilled to be welcoming Dr. Siobhan O'Connor with us this afternoon. She's going to share her expertise with you all. So before we get started, um, I'm Lucy Brown. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Director of Nursing and Midwifery Leadership Development here at the Florence Nightingale Foundation. And I'm very proud to say I'm hosting today's webinar uh, for Dr. Siobhan O'Connor, who's going to share her incredible research um, paper on artificial intelligence in nursing. And she, um, she's a senior nurse lecturer at Manchester University and well, University of Manchester, should I say, and um, is with us this afternoon to share her insights and expertise and really to um, inform you and update you on all of the world of artificial intelligence. So um, if you're able to mute yourselves, it's a bit of background noise, just some housekeeping before I hand across to Siobhan. We are recording today. I will um, ask my colleague to maybe mute everybody on the call just because it's a bit of background noise. Um, we will have a recording today. So if you oh, we might. Charlie, if you can hear me, could you mute people on the call? Because it's a bit distracting with the background noise, if that's okay. Good stuff. So welcome everybody. Um, so just some housekeeping is, um, we will be recording today. So um, if you don't want to be seen on camera, please do turn your cameras off, that's absolutely fine. Um, we will have time for Q&A at the end of Siobhan's lovely um, webinar, so please do pop any questions in the chat box if you don't feel comfortable to ask them, I can ask them on your behalf or raise your electronic hand and, I, um, and we can ask Siobhan in, in turn. Um, but it's absolutely wonderful to welcome you Siobhan, um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and sharing your expertise, to over to you when you're ready, thank you. Great, thanks everyone for coming along, especially on a Friday afternoon, um, I'll just pop up my PowerPoint and then we can get started. Um, so as Lucy said, um, my name is Siobhan and I'm a senior lecturer based at the University of Manchester. To say, um, while I am a nurse, um, I'm also a bit of a nerd. Uh, I'm not sort of 100% nerdy. It's probably somewhere between 20 and 40% depending on the day. But I do have a mixed background with bachelor degrees in both information systems and nursing. And all my research is in digital health around designing, testing and implementing technologies that patients use for self-management. So that's why I'm really interested in artificial intelligence at the moment, because it's quite a hot topic in informatics. And just before we get started, I wanted to do a quick Mentimeter poll to get a feel for how nerdy today's audience is. So if you wouldn't mind um, following the link, um, I don't know if um, Charity can pop it into the chat so people can access it easily and pop in the code to access that Mentimeter poll. Um, but I'd be really curious to see where you think you fall on the nerdy scale. Um, I probably rate myself maybe around a three, I think. So I'm curious if there are other nerdy nurses out there and um, we'll have a look at the results uh, at the end of the presentation. I think I'm in a super nerdy too, Siobhan. You. So I'll <laughs> join you just to make you feel comfortable. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not alone. I'm sure I'm not with, um, you know, 70 plus people on the call. I'm sure there's a few other people out there that are as nerdy as me, if not more nerdy, which would be great. <laughs> <laughs> We'll come back to the, the results in a little while. Um, and just um, for today's presentation, I'll, I'll start with doing a general introduction to artificial intelligence and where it has come from. Then I'll delve into some of the techie stuff and cover the two main domains in AI, which are machine learning and natural language processing and some of the algorithms that are used around that. So the first 20 minutes will be quite nerdy, but if you bear with me, I'll then delve into nursing in the second half in, in more detail with lots of practical examples of AI in nursing and then discuss some of the implications of artificial intelligence and healthcare. So, um, and then wrap up with some suggestions about how to educate and support nurses to get involved in AI initiatives in healthcare. So hopefully um, there'll be bits and pieces in there that will be of interest to all of you. So artificial intelligence, I suppose, is a really huge, huge field um, that generally speaking aims to uh, design computer software that mimics the human cognitive abilities. So that could be anything from abstract reasoning to learning, decision making, communicating or interacting with the world around us if you're, if you're into robotics, bots or indeed gaming. So there's quite a broad um, application areas within AI. And so it's really important, I think, um, there's lots of definitions in the of what AI is and what it isn't. And um, even in the field of computer science, there's no real agreement about um, what it is. People interpret it in different ways. And I quite like 
definition on the slide. It's from um, Samoli et al, which is a, an EU report that has summarized and synthesized um, different definitions of what AI is. And the reason I like this definition is it's uh, quite detailed without being too technical. And then it also takes into account hardware and software and the different application areas of AI. And I also like the bit towards the end where it talks about how AI can use symbolic rules or predictive modeling. And I'll come to those later on because there's lots of different forms of AI. It's not just one particular technique in one application area. So I think that definition is quite useful um, to work from. And just coming back to with the history of AI, it began many years ago in the 1950s after the end of the Second World War when breakthroughs by Alan Turing and others in computing and encryption really sort of inspired people to explore AI. And um, Marvin Minsk and John McCarthy, who are both worked at MIT in the United States, are usually considered to be the founders of the field. And they got together with colleagues and organized a series of meetings and conferences in the mid 1950s and beyond. And that really started research into artificial intelligence. But AI didn't really take off until much more recently. There was lots of experimentation and dead ends, as you'd imagine um, in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And then it wasn't until the early 1990s when advanced computational te techniques like machine learning and natural language processing started to appear. And since then, AI has been rapidly expanding in all sorts of areas, including um, in healthcare. And the other thing to be aware of is that AI also overlaps with neighboring fields like text mining, data science, and good old fashioned statistics because they develop and share similar techniques. Um, so it can be a little confusing when you start reading about AI because you'll see these other terms pop up as well. Um, and interestingly, you will find AI being applied in nursing as far back as the early 1990s, which is really nice to see. Um, the example on the slide is from Harvey. It's one of the earliest ones we found when we were searching for research studies. So even way back then, nurses were really on the ball in terms of informatics. And you know, the rest of us are still catching up about nearly 30 years later. So there are different um, areas within AI, as I mentioned, but for the webinar, I'll just focus on the main two, which are the most popular and widely used set of techniques and their machine learning and natural language processing. But you will come across other things like fuzzy logic and expert systems. And of course, there's lots of sort of blue skies research going on as well in the field of AI. So the main set of AI techniques are called machine learning. And these are all the algorithms that are that are used to learn from past data to build predictive models. And there's sort of roughly grouped in sort of three categories, which are supervised learning, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. And I'll, I'll talk through each of these three and then give you some practical examples from healthcare. So the most popular set of machine learning techniques are supervised learning, and this is sort of how they work. You have an electronic data set to work with and you need to annotate or label a subset of that, which is called the training data set. And the labels are associated with specific features in the data. Then you select one or more supervised learning techniques. So they could be things like decision trees, random forests or support vector machines. And these algorithms all work slightly differently in terms of how they analyze the data. But basically, the algorithm builds a mathematical model based on the labeled data that you've provided and the known outputs. And then it learns the rules or trends that it finds in the training data set to produce the output model. And after that, then you apply the algorithm on the test data set to generate the final predictive output or model. So that's why it's called supervised learning, because you sort of tell the algorithm what to do to some degree by labeling the data and knowing the final output. So that might seem a bit abstract, but this is a practical example of how that works in healthcare. So this is a decision tree, which is the simplest supervised machine learning algorithm and one of the most popular. And it's good at handling classification and regression tasks. Um, don't worry you know, about that bit, but hopefully the diagram helps to visually explain how the algorithm works. It's a hierarchical kind of tree-like structure, which has a root node, branches, some internal nodes or decision points, and then leaf nodes at the end. So the algorithm splits the data in a top-down recursive way until all or most of the electronic records have been classified under the specific class labels or leaf nodes at the end, rep representing all the possible 
outcomes. Um, and the example on the slide is from a Canadian research team who developed and validated an AI algorithm to prioritize access to care home services for older adults. So they created their own decision tree algorithm called Maply for that specific purpose. And this is what it looks like. This is just taken directly from the paper. They used a data set of over 4,000 older adults to identify predictors for nursing home placements. And then they created a computerized decision support tool based on this algorithm to help case managers identify people at risk of or at high need of care home services so that they could prioritize those older people who needed support more quickly and provide that instead of an older person deteriorating at home and ending up in hospital for a couple of weeks or even months when they should have gone to a care home originally. So the link uh, on the slide will take you to that full research paper, which is open access and it explains in more detail how this is done if you'd like to read it, read it. But that's one example of how you'd apply a supervised machine learning technique in healthcare. And the previous slide was just a visual representation of how a decision tree algorithm works. In reality, it looks more like this, which is a lot of code, uh, because the two main programming languages for AI are called Python and R. And there's lots of good books and other resources that will teach you how to write these programming languages if you're really keen. Um, and just to say that AI techniques, whatever they are, they all have their advantages and disadvantages. So for decision trees, the obvious benefit is the simplicity. It's, it's easy to interpret, little or no data preparation is required, and it's very flexible compared to other types of algorithms. Um, however, some of those things are also a drawback because if you've got a large complex data set and very complex decision making, then it's not much good to you because it's too simplistic and it's also prone to overfitting when it comes to running on the training data set and moving that to the test data set. But it is a very popular machine learning algorithm. Another very popular type of supervised machine learning is called an artificial neural network, or it's more commonly known as deep learning. So you might have come across that already. And this is where data is processed through layers. Um, as you can see in the diagram, the algorithm is comprised of layers of nodes containing an input layer, one or more what they call hidden layers, and an output layer at the end, which is why it's referred to as deep learning. So each sort of node or artificial neuron connects to another and has an associated weight and threshold. And if the output of any individual node is above the specific threshold value, then the node is activated and it sends the data to the next layer. Um, otherwise, no data is passed along. And because there are so many layers to neural networks, it's not possible to tell which variables in the data set the algorithm, the algorithm uses to arrive at the final predictive model. So they're often referred to as being a black box. And, and that's and, and just like any supervised um, technique, they rely on training data to learn and improve their accuracy over time, helping to classify and cluster large volumes of data at high speed. So they're very, very popular in healthcare, particularly with image recognition software and radiology, and they're also used in speech recognition systems. Um, and just to note that there are different types or configurations of neural networks which are used for different purposes depending on the data set that you have and the type of complex modeling that you need to do. So again, it's a little bit abstract, but here's a practical example of how a neural network was applied in healthcare to improve the accuracy of diagnosing skin conditions in primary care. So this particular research team developed a web-based tool and they used photographs of skin conditions and the corresponding medical history of patients to build a predictive model based on a neural network. And then the aim was to improve outcome prediction for hundreds of skin conditions in primary care where there isn't a lot of expertise in dermatology. Again, the link to the publication is on the slide and it's, it's open access if, you, if you'd like to read it in more detail. But basically, they had a data set of over 16,000 cases to train the AI model. And then they asked 20 primary care physicians and 20 nurse practitioners to review a subset of those patient cases. Some of them used the AI tool and some of them just the standard approach by reviewing patients' medical records to compare the two. And they found that when the AI tool was used, clinicians were able to identify skin conditions more accurately and it roughly corresponded to a benefit in about one in every eight or ten cases which isn't a massive improvement but it is one good way to apply neural networks in healthcare. 
Okay, so the next category of machine learning then is called unsupervised learning. And these algorithms work differently because they're used to analyze and cluster unlabeled data sets and discover patterns or data groupings without the need for any human intervention, which is why they're referred to as being unsupervised because the data isn't labeled. And again, these algorithms are used for different types of tasks, including clustering, association, and dimensionality reduction. And that's sort of about reducing noise or variance in a data set if it's too big without losing the integrity of data. And again, there's lots of different unsupervised machine learning algorithms. So this is a popular one. It's called k-means clustering, um, where key variables or characteristics in the data are assigned to a number of groups or clusters based on the distance from each group centroid. So the example on the slide is from nurses who developed a patient classification system, and that stratifies patients admitted to intensive care based on their disease severity and their nursing workload. So they extract about 300 critical care patients from a hospital's electronic health record system, and they used a number of AI techniques, including k-means clustering, to assign patients into three subgroups using 16 different characteristics. So eight of them were related to disease severity, and then eight were related to nursing workload, which you can see on the graph. I've just taken that directly from the paper, and again, the link is on the slide if you'd like to read it in more detail. But from using the algorithms, you can see each of the groups are quite different, with group A having the highest disease severity and needing the most nursing care because patients are on mechanical ventilation. So this approach uh, could be used to help nurse managers identify similar patient groups who've got specific care needs and then assign nursing staff according to their levels of clinical experience to improve the management of critically ill patients. Of course, like any AI technique, it needs good quality data work well. And then finally, the last type of machine learning is called reinforcement learning. And this is quite different from the other two because it focuses on optimizing sequential decision making when the decisions are repeated over time and when they occur in a sort of dynamic or changing environment when there's some level of uncertainty. And that really sort of mimics uh, you know, the real world. So um, reinforcement learning works within a sort of mathematical framework consisting of three elements, which are the state space, uh, and that's the available information or the problem features that you have to work with. Then the second one is the action space, so they're the decisions you can take at each state that the system is in. And then the third one is the reward signal, which is the feedback about how the agent or the algorithm performs. It could be positive or it could be negative. Um, and you might also include things like system constraints and uncertainty into your model. Um, again, don't, don't really worry too much about those, but it's really akin to sort of learning by experience. And again, I'll look at a, we look at a practical example in the next slide. But the easiest way to think about reinforcement learning it, is it's used a lot in robotics. Um, and the easiest way to conceptualize them is to think about how a robot learns. So when you're finished designing a robot, you know, you put it into a real environment with a goal to achieve and the robot is driven by AI software using these particular techniques. So say you want the robot to navigate from one side of the room to the other to retrieve something and bring it back. But the robot has no data about the environment it's in. You've only programmed it to move forward, backwards, left or right, and then to sense and pick up an object in any kind of environment. And only when it actually takes an action and interacts with that environment can it collect data to help it learn. So it's no idea how big or small the room is, what is in the room that could get in its way, et cetera, et cetera. And after every action that the robot takes in the environment, it'll receive feedback or what's called a reward. Um, and that will be positive or negative, and it will help transform the robot or the agent into a new state because now it's learned something useful and it's got historical data or learning to draw from that will influence the next action that it takes. And this cycle keeps happening again and again as the robot slowly learns how to navigate the room, making mistakes and correcting actions until it's successful. So reinforcement learning is a little bit more complicated than supervised and unsupervised learning, but it is has lots of really useful applications. And we'll take a look at one now on the next slide in relation to healthcare. Um, it's like all the other techniques, there's, there's loads of different types of reinforcement learning techniques and some of the common ones are called 
and for instance, in Monte Carlo methods. And again, they all have their advantages and disadvantages like any AI technique. So this is one example of how reinforcement learning has been applied in healthcare. And this particular research team, they developed a digital intervention to encourage women to attend for a mammography screening. And it was based on reinforcement learning techniques. So over 100,000 women were sent regular emails over two years to encourage them to attend for a mammogram. And then the algorithms were used to personalize the email content and use behavioral nudging techniques to encourage attendance. So you can see an example of the content on the right of the slide and the link to the published study is there if you want to get more details. And then on the left, you can see they would email groups of women every sort of for four or five months at a time, then take a break and start again. And so over time, the algorithms were used to optimize the message composition based on the women's past behavioral responses, such as opening messages in the email, clicking on calls to action and scheduling and attending mammograms. And then the AI tool selected various contents put in the emails um, to maximize the probability that the recipient would complete the target behavior. Now, they didn't actually look at the effectiveness of this uh, and whether it actually worked or not. It was just a kind of feasibility to st study to see um, how the approach um, would work. But presumably there's a clinical trial ongoing to look at the effectiveness of this. And hopefully it does help improve attendance at mammography screening. But that's just one interesting application of re reinforcement learning in healthcare. And then finally, the last other domain of AI is natural language processing or NLP. Um, and as the name suggests, it uses software techniques, mainly symbolic rules, things like tokenization and part of speech tagging to understand and respond to text or voice data, particularly large unstructured data sets. So, NLP combines computational linguistics or rule-based modeling of human language with traditional statistics, machine learning and deep learning models to process human language, whether it's audio, written text or both, to try and understand what um, that language means. And again, there's lots of clever ways you can apply NLP in healthcare. So this is a research group from the US who extracted um, unstructured free text data such as notes from physicians, nurses and social workers on over uh, 800 children from an electronic medical records. So they extracted the data before the child was referred to child protection team to try and identify which ones were at risk or, or at victims of physical abuse to improve the screening and, and speed up the referral process. And the figure is directly from the research paper, which you can access via the link on the slide. So they used three different NLP algorithms called bag of words, word embeddings and rules based. And they used those to train multiple neural networks to detect cases of likely child abuse from the structured or the unstructured um, medical records that they had. And as you can see, they trained eight or nine different models to see which one would be most accurate and reduce the false positive rate. And now that they've done that piece of work, they want to take the best performing model and develop a computerized platform to speed up and improve the accuracy of screening and referring children to child protection services. So that's one great application of NLP. So we're just coming to the end of the techie bit now, which I'm sure you're glad of, but um, I just want to mention computer vision because you might come across this term in AI and it just means using machine learning and neural networks to understand digital images, videos, and other types of visual data. So for example, uh, how to identify an object in a video or an image, tell how far away it is, whether the objects are moving or not, and whether there's something wrong in an image or a video. So computer vision is used a lot in manufacturing, autonomous cars, and it's got lots of applications in healthcare as well, particularly in medical imaging in radiology. So it's just a term that people use to refer to the analysis of visual data using machine learning techniques, which we've already covered. So um, just in case you come across that jargon anywhere, that's what it means. Lovely. So that's all the technical stuff out of the way and hopefully it wasn't too overwhelming. And um, so now we can come on to the bit about how artificial intelligence is being applied in nursing. 
So um, some colleagues and I did a systematic review to help answer that question last year, and I'll briefly go through the results with you. Um, the, again, the link is on the slide that will take you through the full paper. Um, it's not open access, unfortunately, um, but if you can't get access to it through your own institutions, just drop me an email, there's no problem, and I can send it on. Um, but we included 140 research studies, um, and this isn't everything because there were some limitations in how we search for studies, and the search is over 18 months old now. Um, so there will be newer studies from 2022 and 2023, but hopefully it's a reasonable kind of representation of what's happening with AI in nursing um, at the moment. So in terms of the geographic distribution of the studies, not surprisingly, over 50% were conducted in the Americas, with 65 from the United States, 10 from Canada and two from Brazil. The Asia Pacific region was also represented quite well with 39 studies or 28% overall, and they came from China, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, Australia and Hong Kong. Then 21 studies or 15% overall were based in Europe, including studies from the UK, Finland, Italy, Spain, Ireland, Denmark, Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland and Romania. So there was loads of European countries that have done stuff around AI and nursing. And then there was only three studies or 2% were from the Middle East and um, from Iran and Saudi Arabia. And unfortunately, we didn't find any from the continent of Africa. But there was one multi-center study that incorporated data from nine countries, uh, including one from West Africa, which was Ghana. There isn't any timeline on the slide, but there has been a huge increase in AI research and nursing over the last four or five years, and I've no doubt that that trend will continue. So this is just an overview of where AI has been used in nursing and midwifery research. So most of the studies we found focused on direct patient care, not, not surprisingly, um, over 82%, and the top 10 clinical areas are listed on this on the table um, and with the number of studies um, in that area and an example from each one. So critical care came out on top with 10% of research studies and one application of AI was to develop a model to help predict the risk of ICU transfer within 24 hours for patients with coronavirus. Then the other popular areas were things like wound care, falls, infection, older adult care, hospital readmissions, midwifery, emergency care and hospital discharge. So hopefully that table will give you a nice flavour of where AI has been applied and there's lots more examples in our published review. Um, this inf information isn't on the slide, but we did find 21 studies or about 15% focusing on nursing administration and management. And, and they looked at things like using AI to improve nursing ontologies and terminologies, data quality or written nursing notes, and a few studies tried to identify variables to predict nurse staffing in acute settings, burnout among nurses, their levels of job performance or levels of bullying. Um, and we only found four studies related to nursing education, which I was a bit disappointed about. Um, and they used AI techniques to predict student recruitment from nursing courses, academic failure rates, graduation and completion rates. And there was one study about how nurses could learn to use an echocardiogram using AI assisted software. And then we didn't find any studies about AI being used in the research process itself or in policy related to nursing and midwifery. It was all very much um, clinically based, which is what you'd expect really. We were also really interested to know how involved nurses and midwives were in the research studies around artificial intelligence, and we grouped the results into these four categories. So the first one we called active research, which is the blue bar on the right, and this means a nurse led the application of AI and was the corresponding author on the research study, which was 41 in total or nearly 30 percent. So that's quite encouraging, and uh, those nurses mainly hailed from the United States, South Korea or Taiwan. The second category we called active clinical practice. So that's the small orange bar on the right. And this refers to nurses who participated in, in AI research by providing clinical expertise, for example, by validating and checking the results of a predictive model. And that occurred in nine studies, or just over 6%. Then the third category is called passive, and that's the grey bar at the bottom. And this means that the nurses or midwives were involved as our study participants uh, by providing some or all of the primary data set for analysis or assisting with the implementation or use of the AI based technology. And that was 22 studies or nearly 16 percent. And one of those was midwifery related, whereas no midwives were included in the first two categories. 
And then finally, the fourth category we call no involvement, which means there were no nurses or midwives involved in the development, implementation, use or evaluation of the AI, but they could be potential future users of the AI approach, which is why we included the study in the review. And unfortunately, that was most of the studies, just under 50% or 68 in total, and five of those were about midwifery. Um, and for the studies that were not led by nurses or midwives, they tended to come from a whole range of scientific disciplines, but mainly from computer science, engineering, information systems, medicine, medical informatics, pharmacy and public health. So a whole range of different professionals. And four of the studies were led by commercial companies uh, like Google, who were active, um, very active in the AI space. And there were several limitations of artificial intelligence reported in the studies. Uh, and the quality of the data set was the thing that was discussed most often because it could be poor quality, for example, using self-reported measures which aren't always reliable. Some of the data sets were missing information or the data set might include clinical measures that could be different in other organizations or regions of the world or health systems. And then that might reduce the accuracy of the predictive algorithms, especially if they're developed in one institution and then applied elsewhere where they don't use the same measures. As well as that, then the sociodemographic profile of the population or the geographic setting of the data set may not have fully represented the problem under examination or the algorithms used might not work as well if the data set were in another language. And a handful of studies, about 10% highlighted that alternative machine learning techniques could give you different results instead of the ones that were used because there's so many different techniques now and there's more being developed all the time. And then a smaller number of studies, about 7%, commented on the retrospective nature of the data sets because that might limit the ability to accurately forecast future events. And we certainly saw that during COVID when some of the initial modeling was off because it was a different infectious disease. And then finally, a further 9% or just over 6% of the studies um, noted that healthcare professionals still needed to interpret the results of the predictive models to ensure that they were clinically relevant and that nurses should have assisted more with the testing implementation and evaluation of the AI systems, which might result in some additional work for them if they were doing that alongside their clinical work. Interestingly, we also looked at the risks from the reported studies, and these didn't receive um, an awful lot of discussion at all. In only 13 studies, um, they talked about risk, uh, so that's just under 10%, and they mainly focused on the kind of ethical, legal, and social risks to do with artificial intelligence. So a couple of studies mentioned nurses' lack of knowledge and skills around AI as a risk to future development and use in healthcare. Three studies talked about there was a perception that maybe AI could replace healthcare professionals or be used to supersede their decision making. And another three studies um, noted a concern about the lack of transparency in, some, in how some of the algorithms worked. And we don't really understand the variables that are used to build the predictive model. The costs involved in gathering and analyzing digital data sets that use AI techniques versus some of the benefits that we might get from them were also highlighted because, you know, the technology involved and um, the technical infrastructure and the AI techniques are not, they're, they're quite expensive to put in place. And then the lack of emotions such as empathy in AI based technologies was also a concern, as were potential violations around personal privacy. And that was mainly around using technologies to remotely monitor people at home when there were sensors and other gadgets that were embedded with AI. So um, there are quite a few risk risks to consider um, around artificial intelligence in nursing and healthcare. And just to note that our systematic review didn't cover all the limitations and risks of AI because we could only draw from what the studies reported. But there are some really good reports from the World Health Organization and the United Nations that go into a lot of detail about the ethical and the governance issues to do with artificial intelligence. And I put links to some of those on the slide. So the biggest problem really is algorithmic bias. Um, and that's the main issue with AI at the moment. And it's not really to do with artificial intelligence itself, but with the data sets that are used, because AI is only as good as the data set it's based on. So if there are certain, you know, sorts of demographic information about patients that is missing or certain 
populations of patients that are overrepresented or underrepresented in the data sets that are used, then the predictive model that's built is just going to reflect that. And there are already several examples of gender bias, age bias and racial bias in healthcare and in other areas of society that are being made worse by the application of AI on data sets that don't fully represent the people and the problem and that we're trying to understand, particularly if the AI tool is coming maybe from a private technology company and their algorithms and the data sets aren't open to scrutiny um, due to commercial IP issues. So that's just something to bear in mind if you're working in the AI field. And then at the end of our systematic review, we provide four sort of recommendations on how to develop artificial intelligence in nursing and midwifery. Um, the first, I suppose, is the most critical is that we need to we need to get good digital data sets related to nursing and midwifery. Otherwise, we can't do anything with AI algorithms. So nurse leaders really need to invest in the technical infrastructure to do that, which could be anything from providing mobile devices to collect digital data at the point of care to introducing electronic patient record systems, although there is a significant cost with doing that, whether you know it's a piece of hardware, a piece of software that you're introducing, technology isn't cheap, so it's not a small undertaking and, and it takes lots of time, energy, money and political influence to make those things happen. Then the second recommendation is also very important, which is to educate nurses at all stages of their career about artificial intelligence from students at university, which I'm starting to do here in Manchester, to staff nurses in community and acute settings, to nurse managers, nurse leaders, all the way up to CNOs. Every nurse, you know, no matter where they are, needs to understand the fundamentals of AI because the reality is it's here to stay and it's going to become more and more integrated into professional practice and patient care whether we like it or not. So the sooner we get to grips with artificial intelligence, the better for ourselves and more importantly for our patients, so that the AI tools and systems that are introduced are not completely dictated by the technology industry or by other clinical colleagues. And that as nurses, we've got some say in what comes into our healthcare service. And then once the first two recommendations are in place, it'll be much easier for nurses to develop, test, implement and evaluate AI based technologies to see if they're clinically useful by collaborating with colleagues in computer science, engineering, medicine and other disciplines. And ideally, nurses should lead some of the AI initiatives in healthcare and become involved in its governance to make sure that the algorithms are applied appropriately and vulnerable populations of patients aren't disadvantaged by predictive modelling. And then finally, nurses uh, need to conduct more rigorous interdisciplinary research to see if AI based technologies are actually effective in improving patient and other outcomes, because we still don't know that in a lot of areas in nursing. Um, and mainly because many of the studies that we found in our review only developed and tested AI algorithms. They didn't actually roll out an AI system or tool in a real world with practicing nurses. So we don't know yet what kind of impact AI might have on day-to-day -day patient care and nurses' workflow and their workload and the limitations and risks of AI in terms of their ethical, legal and social implications also need to be looked at in a lot more detail because they weren't very well reported in the studies um, in the review that we did. So following on from those recommendations, um, some colleagues and I developed um, this sort of framework about how to embed AI into nursing practice. And there are four key elements, starting with education, then innovation, collaboration, and finally implementation. And I'll talk through each of these and what you might do yourself if you're interested in introducing AI into your own nursing practice. Um, so we've called the model a line and we've submitted it for publication, but it's available on a preprint server and the link is on the slide if you'd like to read it in more detail. Um, but this is kind of how we see AI becoming embedded in nursing. So starting with education, it's really important, as I said, that nurses have some foundational knowledge on what artificial intelligence is and how to apply it in their professional practice. And there's lots of ways you can upscale, such as reading good textbooks. There's lots of YouTube videos and other resources online although some of them do vary in quality. Um, I've started tweeting any good resources that I find from my AI nurses account. And I published a short article last year just discussing how to teach nursing and midwifery students about AI. And the link for that is on the slide. You can also take postgraduate courses on artificial intelligence at many universities. Um, I run a course here in Manchester. It's called Digital Health and Technology Enabled Care, and the link is on the slide. It's just a general sort of introduction to all things digital in healthcare. It's um, 
a fully online sort of nine week course and we cover artificial intelligence in week four. So it's only one part of a, a bigger course around digital health. Um, and then I'm sure some nurses will want to specialize in specific AI techniques, whether that's machine learning, if you're interested in predictive modeling, or maybe NLP, if you're more interested in understanding and working with unstructured written or audio data sets, or maybe even dipping your toe into robotics, um, for which you'll need a bit of both. And again, there's lots of good textbooks on all the different AI algorithms and how to write programming code in Python and R. Um, and there are many postgraduate courses and full master's programs on AI, machine learning and NLP. And I've put the web links for the one we've, we've here at Manchester, um, but most good universities will have these if there's one closer to you. Um, so there are some ideas to help educate yourself on AI. Um, because without at least basic, if not sort of intermediate or more advanced skills and knowledge, then you know, we can't really do a whole lot with AI in nursing. And moving on to the innovation, if once nurses have a reasonable grasp of AI, I think it'll be very easy to innovate and come up with new ideas about how to apply algorithms to the data sets that we have to solve all the different problems that we have in nursing, either for yourself, your patients or their families, whatever you're experiencing, whether you're in a hospital or out in the community, or maybe indeed you're even in education or working in policy. Um, so you need to have access to digital data of some kind. It can be patient focused, more sort of administrative or managerial in nature or about health service delivery or population level health, whatever you're interested in to solve problems that you're having. And if you don't have an existing electronic data set that you can use, then you can collect your own if you have the systems and processes to do that while taking all the sort of ethical um, issues into consideration. And I'll give you a practical example of what I'm doing myself with some nursing colleagues here in Manchester in a minute. So once you have your idea, then you'll very likely need to work with a range of stakeholders to bring that to fruition. You'll almost certainly need to work with computer scientists who specialize in machine learning or NLP, and they can advise you on which algorithms to use to understand the data that you have and the problems that you want to solve. Or if your organization is big enough, your IT staff might have an analytics team that you can draw on to help you, or you can outsource the technical skills that you need to researchers at a university who specialize in AI or to a commercial software company as well. There's lots of AI companies now um, that we can use. And given, I suppose, the work that nurses do overlaps with lots of other clinical colleagues, you may need to reach out to people in medicine and some of the allied health professions, depending on what it is you want to do, um, because often a multidisciplinary team of people are, are more likely to be successful than trying to do this on your own. Uh, and you'll certainly need the support of your line manager and other nurse managers and directors like your CNIO or your CIO, if you have those roles in your organisation. Um, because if you want to develop a predictive model and you want to introduce it into a clinical IT system, maybe in some form of decision support tool that notifies uh, nurses of patients at risk of something, whether it's sepsis or falls or whatever, then you're going to need a lot of management support and good leadership to be able to do that. And it's going to take a lot of time and energy. You might also want to include maybe patients or carers or their family members in the process, depending on what the focus is that you're doing and get them involved in co-designing an AI tool or system if it's going to directly affect them or the health services that they use. And as I mentioned, industry partners might be an easier route to follow because there are plenty of commercial AI companies now and they might have existing products and services that you can just buy off the shelf and introduce into your organization if it fits with what you're trying to do. So. All of those things are, are important to consider in terms of collaboration. And lastly, implementation. So getting all the data that you need and getting all the people that you need on your side will take some time. But of course, you'll also need funding to be able to do this because AI algorithms are not cheap to develop, whether you outsource the technical skills to the private sector or the public sector, or you get them from inside your own organization, it's going to cost money. You'll also probably need to convince maybe hospital management or whoever holds the budgets and finances in your institution that your idea is worth investing in, that you've got the knowledge Knowledge and skills to be able to do it and it'll bring lots of benefits to staff and our patients. You could also apply for research funding or business commercial funding depending on what you want to do and there is funding available from the NIHR, the Medical Research Council, Innovate UK and other funders if you want to get your idea off the ground. 
And as with all technology innovation and change, good leadership is essential. So you'll need nurse managers and directors on your side to help you introduce an AI tool or system. And there may be clinical safety processes that you need to follow as well. And other considerations around interoperability, data privacy, data protection, depending on what digital data sets you want to use. So doing AI in nursing isn't easy, but I think it's worthwhile putting in the effort if it leads to improvements in patient care and professional practice. So just before I finish up, this is one example of an AI project that I'm working on here in Manchester. Um, a great nursing colleague of mine, Emma Stanmore, has created an online exercise platform called Koku, and there's a mobile app version of it as well. And it's specifically for older adults to encourage physical activity at home and reduce their risk of falling. So Emma's been working on this for a couple of years and she's co-designed the Koku app with older people in the Manchester region. And it's been through all the approvals process. It's been approved by NHS X and it's available to download for free from any of the app stores and, and the link on the slide will take you to that. Um, and it's currently being used in several care homes in Manchester and along with lots of nice exercise videos and games on the app, there are some simple and short questionnaires about um, an older person's mobility, their quality of life, as well as analytics from the older people that use the app. So Emma and I and some other colleagues are applying for funding to um, develop and apply machine or machine learning algorithms to that digital data set. And we want to develop a predictive model for falls in community dwelling older adults. So we're working with a colleague in computer science, Dave Wong, uh, he specializes in machine learning. And then we're going to do some co-design with the older people who use the app to create a digital sort of dashboard so that we can give them updates about their falls risk, whether it's low, medium or high, and then suggest some evidence-based strategies that they might take to prevent a fall. Um, and then that visuals or dashboard based on the predictive model will be integrated into the COCU app and tested via a clinical trial. So hopefully if that's funded, we'll be working on that for the next year or two. And that's again, just one example of, of how we might apply AI in nursing. So other things to keep an eye out on, especially if you're based here in the UK, is that um, there is an AI lab in NHS England, which falls under the new NHS Transformation Directorate. So they've got lots of really nice reports and publications and frameworks on different aspects of artificial intelligence and healthcare. And they've got loads of webinars and nice YouTube videos on different things that are happening around AI in the NHS in England, at least. Um, a lot of it is related to medicine and other professional groups, but hopefully we'll see more of nursing feature there in the coming years. There is also a really nice virtual hub or online community space for people in the NHS to interact and share knowledge and ideas about AI, and that's accessible via the future NHS platform, which I'm sure maybe many of you are already used to using and have got access to. So if you track down that online space, you can join it and um, contribute to the discussions on that forum. And then lastly, the main international congress for nursing informatics will be coming to Manchester next year. Um, uh, the conference website hasn't been launched yet, but I'm on the scientific program committee and we're just finalising details around that at the moment. So we hope to have the website available over the summer so people can register to attend and come along um, and present their work in July of next year. So that's the summer of 2024. And there'll be lots of stuff on AI and nursing because uh, nurses from all over the world, particularly from the US and Canada, will be coming. It's usually sort of seven to 800 attendees every year at the Congress. So if you're really into informatics, it's a great conference to go to and it's wonderful it's coming to the UK and it'll be available for us here in Manchester next year. So that's all from me. Thank you for listening because I know I've been uh, it's a, a long presentation on a Friday afternoon um, and I've covered a lot of stuff. So I hope some of it was useful and I, I hope I've inspired a few of you to be a bit more nerdy. Um, because nurses can definitely contribute to AI and healthcare. Some of us already are, and we'd love more nurses to join us. Um, and I just want to say a quick thank you to the Florence Nightingale Foundation for putting on the webinar, especially Adam and Lucy and Charlie for helping um, do all the background work to get it up and running. Um, I just want to say a thank you to some colleagues here in Manchester, particularly Dave Wong, uh, Risa Batista Navarro, Niels Peak, and Gordon Nandek, who are all based in computer science because I'm always bugging them with questions I have around AI and they're very generous with their time and expertise. 
Um, and finally, I want to say a thank you to Natasha Phillips, who's the CNIO for NHS England, because uh, she and her team have set up and run the Phillips Ives Review recently, which looked at digital transformation and nursing midwifery. And I was able to contribute as an expert on their AI and data science panel because another colleague couldn't attend. And that was really useful to get more insights into what's happening with artificial intelligence in the NHS. So um, that's everything for me. Thanks so much for listening and feel free to contact me anytime. My, um, the link to the university, my university profile is on the slide and my email is on that. And hopefully I haven't rabbited on for too long and <laughs> some time for questions. <laughs> Siobhan, wow. <laughs> I think that's absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and, and expertise. I think there's, there's lots of coming in the chat and there's been a huge amount of questions, which I don't think we're going to be able to get through, but we'll, we'll sure. try and pick some of the key ones out to ask. But thank you so much. And just on the point about the Philip Ives review, mm -hmm. fantastic to see you've been involved in that. And I know that our very own Professor Gemma Stacey has been um, heavily involved. And there will be a launch, I think an, an update of the findings will be shared in May. Is that correct? I think there's going to be a Comments. I think that's in plan. Um, watch this space. I know that we'll be supporting to host that. So we'll let you know. Sam's popping a thumb up as well, Sam. I think you've been involved in that too. So I know plans are at foot, but I can't share anything at the moment. Uh, but I know that we're helping to support with the findings from that wonderful review. So thanks to everybody. So, Siobhan, are you happy to unshare your screen so we can see everyone's faces? There's lots of questions, and I, it would be amiss of me not to kind of pick out. So, Simon, Noel, and Fran have been very very um active on the chat function so i might go to brandon if that's okay first if you wanted to ask one of your many sure. questions to siobhan i'll go to simon as well and then we'll see if we can go to any others but we'll collate all your questions share them with siobhan and make yes. sure we answer them for you too so fran if you're still on the call are you happy to to ask your question or i can do it on your behalf if you don't feel comfortable be able to unmute yourself i can't see fran on the screen actually I'll, I'll ask for her. I'll ask for her behalf. So um, Fran's asked about, if I just quickly go through. Fran, um, Fran's had to leave, sorry. Oh, thank you, Ali. Thank you for letting us know. Because there's no, so many. I can't see you all on the yeah. screen. That's no problem. No, she's got to go to, for another appointment, so she's had to leave. No problem at all. So what thank was interesting you. is Fran, Fran wrote, um, raised an, a concern, a couple of people did actually add to that. They noted there wasn't much um, contributor, uh, contributing contribution, I'm going to speak on a Friday afternoon, for primary care and community health care on AI initiatives. Do you know why that is? Could you yeah. give your opinion? Yeah, the studies that we found were very much hospital based and um, I, yeah, I think a lot of nurses, I guess, are based in hospitals and a lot of clinicians are based in hospitals. So that's probably part of the reason. And I think it can be more difficult to get primary care and community data sets from, you know, different providers, um, especially in some countries like the US, where the healthcare system is privatised. And um, it's a little bit different setup than the UK. And um, so I think that's part of the reason. And um, it's just the volume of nurses are mainly based in, in hospital acute yeah. settings. But it would be great to see more studies from primary care as well. And that's why I love working with Emma, because she's based mainly in the community and works with older adults in care homes and just in their own home and she's trying to collect data sets through her app so um, mm -hmm. actually it, I would really love to know from anybody who's attending if they're already working on AI whether it's hospital or primary care and what's happening out in the world of the NHS. <laughs> Great. Well, perhaps we'll connect as well. And just a, just a secondary thought is um, we've um, the FNF have been really proud to be working with Deborah Sturdy on the formation of the social care nursing councils. Perhaps this is a topic we could take there to encourage their involvement in this yeah. as well. So, yeah, brilliant. Great. Nice to connect people, isn't it, through the FNF network? So thank you. I, think, I don't know if Simon's still on the call. Simon Knoll. Oh, yeah, there he is. Lovely. Welcome, Simon. Lovely to so not quite see you yet. I don't think your camera's on, but if you're happy to ask your question, I don't want to do it on your behalf if you were here. So over to you, Simon. Yeah, Mark, I just put a comment in the chat about um, the uh, the difference between algorithmic rules and artificial intelligence. Because I think one of the misnomers I've seen in the past is that people have said, oh, we're using news too, therefore it's, it's artificial intelligence. And actually, it's just a set of criteria which trigger an alert in the majority of circumstances. Now, the, the, the issue I'd also like to raise is I put a couple of links in the chat regarding to HEE publication on health care confidence in AI. And even in the start of this report, they say we're going to we're going to start using the blanket term of AI um, for algorithmic rules, as well as machine learning and artificial intelligence. I think we've just got to be a little bit careful about the way that we 
we have a terminology of, of looking at AI. And I think you've hit the, all of the, the, the key points with regards to um, um, operational management AI and the ethics and everything like that. But I just wanted to get your views on, on what you thought about, you know, the way the terminology is being blurred across the, 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 the discipline, if you like. Yeah, I think it's really tricky, Simon, because I'm not a super duper expert in AI myself. So I'm just trying to read as widely as I can to get a grab of like what is in AI and what is not. Because from chatting to colleagues in computer science, even within their discipline, there's no agreement about and um, they call it a sort of a, there's a spectrum of AI where there's softer forms of AI that are looser kind of you know, this overlapping with statistics and data mining and tech and data science, and then strong AI, which is really hardcore, you know, large data sets, very complex modeling using machine learning techniques. And even within computer science, it's very difficult to get agreement on what AI is. And um, I haven't read all the publications from HEE, to be honest, because they, they have turned out some really nice reports on AI. Um, but I think that's why I had the definition at the very beginning and um, to try and make it clear what is considered to be artificial intelligence and what is not. And something that I'm concerned about is that there's lots of software companies saying they've got AI products, but actually they're probably not. They're probably just standard pieces of software. And there's no real way to tell if they're actually using hardcore machine learning or NLP techniques because of IP commercial issues. There's no way really to tell. So we're very much reliant on the private sector um, to be upfront and honest in, in, in what they're doing and developing and that it is going to be beneficial and it is actually AI because I'm sure they'll charge quite a lot of money for their sophisticated products. Um, but yeah, you're right. And uh, I don't know if anyone else in the call has um, more expertise than me, but uh, please do chip in um, because it is a very messy landscape and there's a lot of overlap with data science and with text mining as similar sort of related fields and they share a lot of techniques. So um, it is very messy. <laughs> User beware. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I was really curious if Sam Neville could chip in. I don't know, Sam, if anything else came out from the review panels or, or from the Phillips or Ives review, or maybe you can't say yet until it's official. <laughs> uh, yeah, the recommendations I can't talk about really at the moment, but there was lots on the round tables where people didn't know what AI was, and that comes down to the definitions like Simon's mentioned. Um, is it natural language processing? Is it an algorithm or is it actual artificial intelligence? learning um, and that was quite obvious and that came from suppliers as well as nurses on the floor so there is still lots of confusion um, some of the recommendations are around highlighting that confusion and maybe getting a standardized version so let's see what happens great thanks sir <laughs> Thank you so much and apologies for that. I think um, I just momentarily uh, lost connection there. So back in, thanks Sam and thanks Siobhan. Well, sadly we've run out of time, which feels such a shame because it's such a, a hot topic and it's really great to see the interest and in so many people joining us on a Friday afternoon as well. We've recorded the session so you can get, get back somewhere where there was a lot of information shared with you in a quick, a quick time. So you can go back, read it, but I really encourage you, please do share this with your colleagues. It's available on our YouTube channel for you to access at a later date. So it's a it's a wonderful wonderful resource for us all and Siobhan thank you so much for sharing your expertise we feel really grateful for your time um, and sharing um, with a, a wider audience and perhaps we could get you back again um, to share further some of your findings I think I think there's a lot of interest in this topic judging and, and particularly after the Philip Ives recommendations I think it'd be wonderful to get yeah. you back and Sam perhaps get you involved as well so thank you all thank you all so very very much for joining us this afternoon it's a pleasure to host the FNF webinars um, just to promote our next webinar is going to be hosted by Howard Prescott, one of our FNF scholars, and he's looking at care relievers, a hidden health inequality. That's on the 1st of March, and just next week at 1.30 if you can join us. Um, just to be mindful, it'll take a couple of days of the recording to be available, so please do share it as I, I said earlier. I'm going to share the slides, I think that's a question in the chat. Slides will be sent with you pretty much as soon as we finish now, they'll be sent across, you can share and use those as a resource. So please do share far and wide to make sure we really do increase people's knowledge and understanding on AI as, as Sam and Siobhan has really rightly pointed out, we need to raise that awareness and understanding. So thank you all, have a wonderful rest of the afternoon and the weekend when you get there and um, look forward to seeing our future webinars. Thank you all, great to, great to see you, take care. <laughs>